to welcome, uh, to welcome Frank Barco back to the AA, a good friend and a, and a great friend of the school, someone that I began my teaching years with here, working alongside in one of the other units. Um, one of the nice things about everybody who meets everybody here is watching friends' careers start, crystallize, and then launch um, in very big ways. Frank and Regina at, at Barclay Leiden here in Berlin are in just such a position now. They've had an amazing year or two of prizes, publications, and really their first major large-scale buildings that are now getting out on the international stage, and Frank's going to share some of that work with us um, tonight. The, the title of tonight's talk is Manufacturing Material Effects, <coughs> and it's a title that, that very much alludes to one of their preoccupations in the office, which is is quite a sustained and in-depth analysis and experimentation and research into uh, all kinds of advanced computational and manufacturing technologies, which for many years sort of operated at the level of, of that kind of dreaded AA word prototype that everybody says, you know, a kind of object that was sitting in a space in a studio or on exhibition here in the building. I can remember some of Frank and Frank's students work out here on the balcony. We, we stepped outside this room nearly a decade ago, which were the first early attempts by him and his students to experiment with what these kind of technologies could do to very familiar kind of materials that architects are accustomed to working with. And, and they got interested in early, and after several, many years of sustained research into what these things offer, began applying them in, in many different ways to buildings or projects of all scales, and we're seeing some of the most recent results in the large-scale design work of things like the Tree Tech Building in Korea and several others that I'm sure Frank will be showing tonight. I think that the point to emphasize, and it's a, it's a rare kind of office that, that treats its working space as an, ar as an architect as a, as a genuine studio, where there's, there's all kinds of sort of nutty experiments going on that don't appear to connect to any strict building project, which will be the focus, I'm sure, of a lot of the material tonight, but which really is taken on in a kind of open-ended experimental and research-based form of practice. And they're an absolute incredible generational example of that that's leading through, through their uh, building work in just the past few years. Um, uh, the True Tech Building in Korea, which is the subject of of this publication by Hot J. Kant that came out, uh, I believe, last spring around the world, and which several of us wrote essays for, um, is, a, is an incredible early example of what mass customization will bring to architecture and building at the scale of a medium-sized office structure um, in a remarkably kind of concise form. And, and the book is an incredible story, really, of all of the kinds of analysis, experiment, tests, and, and the incredible production process itself of assembling this facade uh, in Seoul, Korea, by an office based in Berlin, working in technologies in a different city, which are being applied across different parts of the world. Their current projects include a campus uh, restaurant at Brötzingen, a conversion of an apartment block in Berlin, uh, a factory in Seinfeld, uh, uh, and a design facility for an unnamed company um, which will be released soon, which um, um, is going to be a kind of major statement of, of what design research operates as in other industries today, in addition to just architecture. Um, the profile of the firm includes uh, a sustained interest in industrial as well as institutional projects of all scales. They've built at many different scales for many different kinds of programs throughout Germany especially, but also overseas. Um, Frank originally trained on the west coast in the United States, in Montana, and found his way, as some of us did, to the east coast, from which he then escaped to Europe. Um, Frank studied at Harvard at the GSD and has taught at Cornell, as I said, here at the AA, back at Harvard at the GSD, and recently as a guest professor in Stuttgart at the Staatliche Academy. Um, his work is included in in collections around the world, including the Pompidou Center, um, the Deutsches Architecture Museum, and the Heinz Arts Center. And in 2007, Barclay Leidinger received the Marcus Prize, recognizing the work of a young international architect, um, which will lead to further research, studios, and work that you'll be seeing in a couple of years' time, I'm sure. Please join me in welcoming Frank Barclay.
Thanks for the introduction, Brad. It was uh, really uh, very precise and, and, and really uh, a perfect one. And um, I think it was quite important. I think, I think when we were starting the practice in Berlin in the early 90s, at the same time, we did start teaching here. So um, there was this kind of, um, you know, at the same time, you know, starting using the teaching as a way to kind of uh, stake out our p position at the same time starting the practice. So this was an incredibly, uh, incredibly important place for us uh, to start both academically uh, in conjunction uh, with uh, with the practice. Um, I hope uh, you've got off to a good start the last two weeks. I do remember fondly uh, my years here as a kind of best worst experience in terms of going to the interview. So uh, I think you've <laughs> enjoyed it as much as uh, uh, we did. Um, I think. Um, let me let me just get rolling here. Um, could you, you might hit the lights a little bit. Some of these are a little hard to read. Thanks. Um, this is my, my version of, a, of a, a Sal Steinberg's sort of model of the universe. And the idea of this sketch was to show kind of uh, the trajectory of how we've been working, you know, for the last, you know, 10, 15 years. And I think when we first arrived in Berlin in the early 90s, it was very much about this pulling the city back together. And, uh, you know, it, it all been sort of staked out in the, in the center. So much, most of our work was happening. Uh, in the periphery, which was interesting, and it also overlapped with what we were doing here. Uh, in the meantime, I, I think that that really strong dialectic of sort of working in, in Berlin center to edge has kind of loosened up, and I think we find ourselves doing competition through Europe, um, teaching commitments in different places, as Brett mentioned, uh, and projects in very different places. So I think um, that, 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 that whole sort of strong, strong sort of identity of the office being in a sense, landscape-based and, and, and working in the uh, periphery has really sort of loosened up in terms of the kinds of work and the kinds of collaborations we're doing um, in the office these days. I think, um, you know, we're probably, you know, fairly um, representative of our generation in terms of how one approaches architecture, uh, a fairly, uh, I would say, almost nonchalant or kind of uh, idea of an evolving practice, um, you know, reacting to sites and programs and, and building cultures, um, in a sense, as they come. So I think there is a kind of looseness of that, of, of that, that sort of fit in how uh, we work. Um, a lot of our work um, particularly started, um, you know, again, beyond the sort of Berlin discussion uh, in places uh, like southern Germany and Stuttgart particularly, and now more recently uh, in Munich, uh, where Again, the sort of industrial concentration of uh, Germany exists. Uh, and we worked in places like this, you know, these kinds of very loose, fragmentary uh, peripheral sites, you know, crisscrossed by Autobahn infrastructure, uh, agri very piecemeal sort of agricultural um, uh, infill. And, and, and the project that I'm sure a lot of projects, you know, both projects about as well as technologies coming out of um, has been for the Trump uh, machine tool company. Uh, in Stuttgart, uh, it's adjacent here to the A81 uh, Autobahn. Uh, it's um, it's a company that's been around, you know, for for 30, 40 years. Uh, it's built uh, a machine tool company that's taken on lasers for cutting. Uh, and the, the first sort of problems were, um, you know, reacting to this, you know, sprawling industrial complex, you know, in relationship to one of these, you know, very gemütly sort of small German uh, villages over here uh, along the Autobahn here. Uh, we had inherited uh, this track of buildings uh, that were done in the 60s and 70s, and it's, you know, very much the kind of hierarchical, you know, white-collar guys over here uh, and, and the blue-collar guys down here. And, and the first idea was to develop a master plan across the street here uh, for these factories that could, in a sense, expand infinitely out to the west and along uh, the Autobahn here. So, uh, you know, we were interested in these constructivist models, you know, for the green factory and factories that, in a sense, could cultivate agricultural lands, um, but in a very unpredictable way, where you could add program or, or, or tracts of land uh, as it came along, so that you could have a starting point for two phases here and continue on. In the meantime, we started doing more and more projects over on this side, which is a mu very much a sort of collage approach. Um, where um, we're adding, you know, a project here. We did a project here. I'll show in a minute in detail a new gatehouse here versus the project on the West Campus, um, which was very much thought about as a very kind of serial, repetitive 
uh, structure, again, where you could add or change or adjust as, as programs uh, and, and, and need or costs uh, uh, shifted. So there was an idea of a kind of axis where you could, um, you know, pull this building out to the west, into the landscape, and, and in, a, in a sense, you know, create these, these, these green spaces in between, these fingers of spaces there, um, or, and, and then simply, you know, just keep adding onto this um, uh, spine as a very much expansive building or uh, additive uh, project where you could kind of clip the facades off, put them on, or, or expand it. So this was, you know, very much about, um, you know, a redundant structural system, very simple sort of steel roofs, um, and concrete uh, um, column grid, uh, but but very much uh, interested in. Uh, it's not that good. Hey, that's not good. Um, yeah. ah, that was good. Let's see. Don't touch it. Um, but um, the, the, this idea of, of 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 a steel structure and recovering some of these uh, ideas of the early twentieth century uh, industrial buildings in terms of daylighting and, and the workplace, how that could be um, less of a hierarchical place but, but, but more uh, almost like the agricultural lands as a, as a kind of patchwork of, of, of programs. So I, I didn't want to go into this too much detail but I wanted to introduce this project as a kind of first step in some of the work we've done um, down there. Um, when we were at the A in the, in the uh, 90s, uh, as Brett was saying, this idea of a prototype um, it was a kind of reversing of the process where we started to look at a component-based architecture where uh, students were looking at uh, steel laser cut components, components that could collect into much, much more uh, complex and expansive systems. In this case, a kind of retaining wall system, which then would get pulled out of the studio and taken to Berlin uh, for siding there. So, um, so this became, at that time, you know, a very interesting, in a way, autonomous research area from what we were doing in the office. Um, but at the same time, I think in the meantime, uh, a lot of this work has, has, has drifted um, uh, into, into the studio itself. So we'll bring s lots and lots of students into our studios and run almost uh, a kind of studio-like atmosphere uh, for, in a sense, real projects uh, in the offices that, that expanded this. And, and, and like the academy, I think they run in the office as a kind of protected um, endeavor or a protected body of work, you know, separated from, you know, clients and, and budgets and deadlines, sort of, um, in this way. But it, it was an interesting way, this, this kind of back and forth between um, how we used to work, you know, in, in, in the school and how we start to work in in a studio-based practice. But at the time I came to Europe uh, and was teaching for Cornell in Rome in the early 90s, I was you know, very interested in these, this idea of, Joseph Connors was talking about things like San Ivo from Borromini, um, that the, the spiral form of it actually came about through the invention of the wood lathe, so that somehow through tooling started to have um, a very direct um, impact on form making uh, as well as, as, as spa uh, space making. Um, so that, um, at the same time we were working with Trump, we started to become more and more interested in uh, the machinery uh, that they produce there. Uh, it's laser cutting that's gone from two-dimensional cutting to uh, complex three-dimensional cutting and also cutting uh, complex uh, uh, forms. Um, so as we were bringing studio students into the, uh, the, the office, we, would we started to do inventories of these machines just to get a sense of, of what they could do, and the, the fundamental machines you'll you know you'll be familiar with two-dimensional cutting, um, but then we would expand two-dimensional cutting through scripting programs, um, which could create um, screen walls or uh, moiré conditions, and we, we we started producing all these things through these different you know sort of action activity bending verbs, um, and start producing this material that in a sense as as Brett was saying is was kind of programless. We could sort of accrue this material and, and catalog it, or uh, in a sense put it in a library in the office, and then uh, it was available to anybody in the office and they could start using this or sort of plugging it in uh, to pro uh, projects. So there was an understanding about software and scripting and how components, um, you know, how many bends can you get out of a piece of metal and how that could um, nest into much complexer um, structures. 
Um, you know, we did, we did workshops that came out of some of the things we did here. This was a workshop in Minnesota uh, that we did uh, that came out of um, some of the work that Jörg Concept was doing in Switzerland. We were doing a building with him. And this was about a kind of uh, three-dimensional matrix, structural matrix. I, I call it sort of Jörg Concept on acid. But it, but, but it has a kind of logic to it of, of uh, a kind of webbing structure that we could use the bent metal not per se to use that material itself, but to use it as a kind of formwork um, for the actual uh, pouring of a translucent concrete. So uh, at the same time, understanding things like this, Jefferson's uh, Virginia uh, serpentine walls as these extremely thin brick walls, but you know, self-stabilizing systems um, that could be interpreted through new um, casting uh, techniques to produce a kind of three-dimensional uh, box beam that could then span over uh, uh, you know, a huge amount of space um, underneath it. Um, the evolution of these tools has become also more interesting. I think one of the things we're very interested in, in right now is uh, revolving laser cutting, uh, which means you could take, uh, instead of cutting flat sheet, you can take tube stock uh, and rotate that and cut that. Uh, that started to create these, you know, we could create these very idiosyncratic pieces like this or more um, regular pieces. And at this time, I think we started to think ab again, I think uh, applications much, much more clear. So this was, um, I hate to use the word, but prototype for a, a kind of showroom building here where by uh, attaching these uh, screens uh, and then at the same time allowing them to, to rotate, um, we could condition how the light came into the spaces. So, um, so all of a sudden these, these, these sort of before sort of unnamed uh, pieces started to have a stronger and stronger role in terms of the buildings uh, we were doing. Uh, in this case, was a prototype for a, a, um, a facade system uh, through bending the metal and then, and then laser cutting the profiling of it, we could uh, produce a structural uh, component. So something like this, um, we had, again, they're sort of available. We could plug in uh, quite quickly to an architectural project. This is a competition we won a few weeks ago in Stuttgart across from the Weissenhof Siedlung. Uh, in the site of a former quarry. So there was, there was ambitions about this project, you know, spatializing this thing here in, in relationship to the quarry wall and the facade. And at the same time, um, we could start to plug in uh, a facade system that, that could be performative, it could, you know, control light. Um, it's a so-called fashion mall is the, the program. So it was a fairly economical um, system that, that we could apply to this facade. And, and it had the sort of virtue that it was very easy for us to, um, you know, within days, you know, win the competition, go to the client and go, he goes, how are you going to do that, you know? And, and we could produce these uh, prototypes like right off the bat, you know, and, and the guy goes, okay. And they're very efficient. You can sort of, you know, harvest, you know, there's no waste of material. You cut it, you can get three pieces out of one tube. So, um, so there's this kind of, you know, speeding up of, of you know, what you'd usually expect is a detail that would kind of show up in the process, you know, months and months later. Um, other pieces were um, these, these LED uh, flex lamps uh, that we designed that, that understood the logic of, of this kind of suturing, cutting that would hold the piece together but still uh, allow uh, light to leak uh, through, through the gap. So, um, as well as um, uh, welding and inflation, this is, this is a, another process that in a sense, the, the technicians there came up with of, 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 of welding sheets of, of, of uh, metal together and then inflating them under uh, air pressure. Uh, again, without any idea of what uh, these things uh, might be used as. So, so we would sort of take these things and produce things like um, radiators for, for lobbies with these things. Or uh, we started producing this series called album covers, which we'd inflate them and then go back in and, and cut these. And then these things would um, drift uh, into these things. This is a, a, pro a prototype for door grip for uh, FSB in Berlin. And then um, this is the so-called, I guess, sex toys version of uh, that one where you could clad these with uh, um, different, um, uh, well, materials, I guess. Um, at, at the same time, th there's things that we're doing that are quite, quite uh, I would say, quite archaic uh, casting. Um, We've been doing ornamental casting that then uh, can be used for radiant heating or cooling. It generates uh, more surface area. So I think it's not necessarily technology to produce things that are overly techn technological, um, but I think there's also 
you know, been an interest in terms of drifting back and forth, how that might work. Um, another competition, again, just sort of a, a competition supporting some of this research was a project in Dresden, it was a so-called Gewandhaus. Uh, this is a site here of a former sort of um, commercial building here. There's a competition for a new uh, building here that would be for uh, shopping, uh, restaurants. Uh, within the context of this extremely uh, broke uh, city that then had this kind of, you know, DDR, East German invasion of, of modernism back in the, you know, 50s, 60s. Um, the idea was to, to, to recreate uh, a kind of broke architecture, um, but, but through its articulation, through the actual tectonic of this thing would become um, something um, quite different. So uh, the first exercise was a kind of morphing of all the historical uh, buildings that have been proposed for this site over the last 200 years uh, to create a kind of uh, total, um, you know, massing diagram of this thing and then to begin to interpret it. So through, again, through the tooling, again, there was an interest in looking at the broke in terms of profiling, how that could work as a, uh, which began to become a stacked um, procedure in terms of stacking pieces up. Um, so it would both resemble, you know, uh, you know, keep you know, keep one generation definitely happy in, in, in Dresden in terms of creating an architecture that would be, um, you know, identifiable, um, iconographic in terms of being in the, in the same time would achieve a, a certain level of abstraction that had to do with its actual making. So, so the, through this Baroque uh, uh, interpretive approach to this um, and through stacking, we could produce these kinds of wall conditions. Um, these were student projects at Harvard, the last semester we taught there, where they were using Rhino software to produce these incredibly uh, amorphic shapes. This, this, if you saw Thomas Demann's project at Serpentine, you know, it, it furs th furthers that discussion, you know, quite a bit further. But um, there was an idea, an ease that through either laser or water cutting, uh, depending on the, the technique that we could produce, uh, these wall systems. And again, in a kind of Disneyland type block where all these buildings are being sort of de facto um, renovated um, as, uh, as historical buildings. Um, we want it to be both sort of familiar and, and in a sense strange uh, at the same time. So that uh, through, this, through this sort of filtering or, or, or layering of stone, you could produce a facade like that um, that would, you know, could transform quite a bit in terms of how you saw this thing or approached it or the transparencies of it. So, uh, and, and even though the, the project was a complete failure <laughs> in terms of a, of a competition, for us it was, it was a very interesting sort of exercise how to operate in, again, these incredibly uh, historically saturated sites, but at the same time bring something um, uh, very new to it. Um, I, I just I wanted to go through, I think, another half an hour or so, but I wanted, I wanted to go through some of the, the more recent projects uh, we've been doing again on that Trump campus in Stuttgart. You saw this one. Um, another project is, is an office building we did along uh, the Autobahn. Uh, the issue for this was going to be, in a sense, how do you uh, treat that site as almost like a reclamation project because you've, you're along the Autobahn here, so you have cars flying through there. It's incredibly uh, loud. Like, how can you reuse that piece of land um, as um, uh, for office space, you know. So the, so the two big issues with this project was, one was sustainability, how does that become, you know, architecture instead of a kind of, you know, from the American sense, a kind of leads checklist. And um, th then uh, in the section, there was also the idea of engineering for it um, and, and how this thing sits in the, this kind of a landscape. So. Um, so it sits, uh, so it sits along the Autobahn, so the rest of the campus is back here, so this thing is this sort of boxy volume that's, you know, like some of the other volumes that are driving down the, the highway here, but um, to create an office space where the second issue really is about communication, how do you break down the kind of, you know, typical German, you know, office space, so that there was two bars that, that, that shift both in plan and section that float above kind of public exhibition spaces ex and uh, uh, lecture rooms down at this base. This all kind of, you know, emerging out of this 80s, you know, kind of near glass stuff over here to create uh, a courtyard um, here for the, for the clients where they, where they enter through this thing. So, and, you know, we work um, still in analog models quite a bit, so there was a, a whole level of studies on how the, the base could start to work as a, as a ground or as a, a kind of topography 
um, leading to these, again, these pieces sort of hovering uh, over this, this base condition. So there's kind of three crystal cube spaces. Uh, and the way that this whole thing was put together was a kind of preparation of the ground uh, through this topography, a kind of setting up this split level condition here. Uh, then these three crystals are placed in relationship to these cores uh, here. Uh, then these, these huge slabs, these like one meter slabs that cantilever off the ends. These things would hold the, uh, the office spaces, which we wanted to be very much uh, like loft spaces. So these are ventilation chimneys here. Uh, which also uh, accommodates the split level condition. These are a series of, of stair bridges. Uh, that's the slab on the, on the Autobahn. That's the one on the entrance courtyard. And then we had this idea of a kind of multitasking double facade, which is, you know, the kind of, <laughs> you know, German, you know, green building thing. But in this case, we could use it for, um, you know, acoustical reasons. We could use it for um, uh, cooling in the summer. We could use it for heating in the winter. Um, all the sun protection was in there, so um, we got a lot of mileage out of this thing that, that, that made this, um, you know, a much more legitimate sort of approach than it might otherwise um, be. The plan is organized as a series of, again, these three these crystals with the entrances occurring um, in these cuts. Um, the construction, which is something we, we amp up, I think, in these, these newer projects, but there was an idea of a kind of branching structure over some of the larger spans. Uh, in, the, in the auditorium spaces. Um, that branching structure then we could sort of infill with um, corrugated uh, cooling surfaces. So that, again, there's, through the whole project is this kind of desire that all of these things that are, you know, make buildings sustainable, make them, um, um, you know, more economical, more efficient, would always be uh, an architectural idea at the same time. So that in the base, um, we started laser cutting a, a wall like this, which is an air supply uh, wall for it, and then sort of carving uh, lighting into the bottom of that uh, supportive uh, um, these, these slabs through here. And then spatially, sectionally, you get this um, through the use of fire doors, we were able to have these open sections through it. So you start to see those crisscrossing um, stair bridges uh, above uh, the ground floor which is a, supported by a series of concrete, um, uh, like shear walls, uh, which is a very different structural system than, than that what we have. And then uh, we use concrete. It's, it's, it's either this kind of, you know, like bush hammered concrete here, or smooth concrete here, or concrete above, uh, which is also exposed so that we can use it again for heating or cooling as a, as, as a radiant um, surface. And then, you know, using at the same time uh, very, in a sense, primitive materials like a, a uh, industrial wood kind of butcher block uh, flooring in here and then these are reflected ceiling plans of those those two slabs here and then uh, assuming other construction models you know this was almost like a uh, oh like using bridge building techniques or almost like overpass highway techniques in terms of constructing those slabs for the offices and then inlaying uh, cooling uh, you know uh, conduit through it with, with steel so I think one of the interesting things about German engineering is somehow just, you know, using it, accessing it for um, projects that might be slightly outside of the, of, of the normal typology for working with that. Uh, this explains, uh, starts to explain uh, the split level idea. Um, the double facade is very much placed onto the building as a volume. It has a thickness of about 80 centimeters. Um, so it was important that that was legible as, as, as a very different piece of of architecture than a typical facade system. And then, you know, we, we did, you know, little diagrams with the arrows. So uh, for, 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 you know, cooling, using those towers to cool the spaces, double facades here, bringing air through here and cooling up here, and then uh, using all this concrete to uh, cool the space. So, I mean, and this was really our first, you know, really took it on, the, the issue of, of, of energy engineering with uh, Matthias Schuler from Transolar, who's, you know, very creative sort of, energy engineer based in Stuttgart. So again, sort of tapping into those um, kinds of resources uh, down there. Um, and also the idea that the building would be communicative, that you would use these places as uh, visually open uh, on the diagonal. You can see through uh, these spaces through here. It allows teams to uh, move um, or connect to other floors or expand in a very easy way. So this kind of soft edges, you know, really wanting to get away from, um, you know, the typical office, you know, cubby hole, veal fattening pen sort of approach to 
um, uh, tier uh, space making so uh, or, or office plan layout. So I think there was um, wanting to create a very open loft like space here, but then uh, with this kind of transparency and, and connectivity uh, through the building uh, this way. Uh, working closely with, you know, got the guys from Bitra to, to design systems that were much lower, much, much open uh, in relationship to this, you know, pretty much, you know, panoramic view out through uh, the, the, the Stuttgart landscape. Um, you know, this being a detail of, 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 the, of the double facade, again, that what, what it allows you to do is have a very simple, very primitive, uh, just single layer of glass on the outside clipped in onto a steel T and then uh, double glazing uh, in the back, you know, the sun stuff up here, uh, and then a grating here so this whole thing can act like a chimney or a chimney effect to, to pull hot out air out of the office spaces up and out of the, out of the building. Um, the building, um, so and, th and this is another building down, down uh, uh, the street from that one. I just showed you this one. This is the so-called gatehouse project. Um, the historically, the entrance to the campus was over here. So they, they, they kind of put the stairs through here and then put a gatehouse in this position. And this, and this was going to be uh, a kind of demonstration. And we finally, you know, we were using their, their tools and it was always in a kind of decorative secondary level. And we really wanted to do a building that, that took the technology on in a really comprehensive uh, way. So, so, so the building, you know, it's very muscular. <laughs> it's cantilevering an insane amount, you know, 22 meters off the side here. You know, it's like, and, and we did the engineering with, with Werner Sobeck, and, uh, and, and I think when we went in to the workshops, I had a wall here, and he said, no, oh, just get rid of it. You know, <laughs> so it was, it was about using their laser technology to create a kind of membrane that could cantilever oil here as the kind of, you know, a front address to, to this campus to show um, precisely uh, what they could do. At the same time, you know, this building is it's out in the perimeter, it's near all these factories, gas stations, it's in this kind of razzmatazz um, uh, context, so it, it, it but, but, but in a kind of hyper way uh, through its structure and through its secondary detailing, it's much, much more sophisticated. Um, of course, we were, we were interested in this history of, of Jean Prouvé's uh, work in the 40s and 50s. This is a gas station that uh, Rolf Feldbaum um, acquired, bought for his campus at Vitra, uh, where there was this idea of a kind of total architecture through uh, the folding of metal, um, uh, the furniture systems, the structural systems were one thing uh, that came out of his. Uh, also a very much a kind of factory workshop uh, approach where, th where these projects could really come out of a, of a factory that he was directly um, engaged in. Uh, we knew that Trump was doing things like this, which are these kind of laser cut and welded uh, decking that you, this could operate at the scale of a, of a ship or a ship bulkhead decking or at the scale of a, of a, um, a tabletop. And, we, and the question was, can, can we acquire this technology uh, at the scale of a piece of architecture? Um, and, and the answer was sort of. <laughs> we, we, we were able to, 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 to start cutting this thing, but again, to produce this at the model scale and then started to focus very much on, on the making of the roof. One of the things that we got uh, quite early on from Werner uh, at the workshop phase was, and, and typically we work with engineers, all these guys at the beginning of a design process, not like in the middle or at the end. So, um, so Werner was producing these loading diagrams. Um, this is a column here, a column here. These are in compression and these are in tension in the back. And then we would begin to try to interpret those loading diagrams um, through uh, one to 50 uh, laser cut models. So, and we were also excited about the idea that the models would you know, kind of close that representation gap where in a way the models start to, you know, could be built like the buildings. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and we could you know, do different test patterns for that, test them, see which ones were more economical, which were stiffer, which were um, uh, in a sense better. Uh, leading to the to the final uh, model, which was this one, and, and there was also a real desire to make um, to make the structure to make this stuff legible. That you could actually look at this thing and, in a very sort of apparent way, understand um, how at the end of the cantilever it would become very very um, light, and then at the loading points it would become very stiff, very stable. Um, all of this, you know, cantilevering over a you know very straightforward plan, uh, a core here with columns here, column here, column here. Uh, mechanical stuff over here, and then uh, a very light curtain wall uh, finishing uh, the enclosure uh, of the space um, so that in 
the section, you have these kind of cassettes going da 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 here through here. And then we had this gigantic counterweight in the ground, which is the foundation, just to keep the thing from not, you know, tipping over. So, um, and, and at the same time, uh, certain other parallel areas, uh, this is the lighting diagram. We started using those coffers as, as, as places where we could put lighting that could change in color, um, could change over a 24-hour uh, cycle. We started doing plywood mock-ups uh, in, uh, in the office at a scale of one to two to see um, how these things uh, might work. Uh, and then made uh, a one-to-one -one mock-up to see how we could, you know, and, and, it, and it was, you know, very hybrid. I mean, it was about laser cutting, um, bolting certain sections together, welding certain sections together, integrating uh, a gutter system uh, into it, but, but uh, really using, I would say, not the prototype so much, but the idea of the mock-up as a kind of controlling uh, instrument leading into the um, construction of the, the architecture. So you see these guys in, you know, very straightforward manner, uh, uh, welding at this point, these pieces key together and uh, for expansion uh, joints, um, although the, the, the actual dynamics of the thing were incredibly complex in the sense you had this very plastic surface that's deforming, so the calculations were, were, were really crazy. It, it, we had to camber the thing this way and then camber it this way to get the whole thing to come in peace. Uh, these are the strips coming on site onto these templates. Uh, these are the protected uh, columns here. Um, then sort of bolted these things all together and then at some point, you know, lifted it up and then, uh, you know, had this thing supported by these uh, gurneys and then, you know, you take the gurneys away and hope that it's still standing, uh, <laughs> which it was. But this whole thing was sort of, you know, flexing and it had these points here and here where you could kind of adjust it, you know, you could kind of like tweak it and bolt the thing so that it could adjust it. So it, like a lot of it, some of it are very high tech and some of it's very sort of straightforward and, and low tech. One of the things we had to do was, was load the thing with sandbags to get it into shape. You know, if you remember from your history books, the Frank Lloyd Wright column where he loads with sandbags until it's crushed. In this case, there was a kind of fine tuning of, of sandbags to kind of bring that thing um, into shape, almost like if you thought of a ski with camber, kind of like flexing it um, until it, it, it straightened out, um, which, you know, produced, you know, this, you know, uh, from the campus side. Uh, or uh, again, th this side here. The project also at night works, you know, very much as a kind of lantern or, or an entrance for the building, uh, as well as in this cantilever. There was there was secondary, um, you know, grids that were light laid into this to sort of keep the uh, the, the pigeons out <laughs> and sort of things like this. But um, as well as you know the gates, these telescoping gates, which were per perforated and as they move open and close, they produce this whole kind of uh, moraved uh, light show. Um, it was also, uh, as in the drawings, important that there be a kind of transparency from the exterior to the interior that you would read that structure continuing through um, th this uh, curtain wall, which is a 20 centimeter curtain wall. We worked with, you know, local craftsmen who filled that cavity with, um, these are plexiglass tubes that they're very small at the bottom and then very big at the top that sort of gradiate uh, from the bottom to the top in the spaces, um, you know. <laughs> We, you know, like things like this where you know, it's a very primitive, you know, very old historical way of, I guess, time intensive too, probably, but uh, for fence making in, in, in Germany of this kind of stacking in, in between these stakes. So there was a similar logic of staking these between these plexiglass um, facade posts and then gluing them together with a kind of capillary glue to pull the whole thing and uh, to shape where it has, you know, obviously a very a sort of ornamental structural role at the same time uh, acts as a kind of sunscreen uh, for the building, uh, casting shadow onto these plexiglass clad uh, core spaces uh, in the back. Um, so, and I get very interested in things like this where you have this incredibly brittle, stiff facade system, you know, interfacing with this incredibly flexible and moving uh, roof. So, so you need something like this, this kind of shock absorber uh, detail that lets everything move independently um, from each other. So, and this was al also worked out with, with Werner's office. But um, and but, but something that I was also very interested in here when we were here is how, you know, the technical studies always um, played a direct role, in in the making of architecture, which which I always thought was a very compelling uh, approach to, to a, a kind of education, which is something that we deal with um, every day. Um, 
the, the second project, which we just, we just topped out, was that, was that we were topping out, right? We finished that last week. It's a complex restaurant. Is this piece, um, again, if you remember that, that auditorium here, there was an idea of continuing with this, this idea of a kind of polygon geometry. And one of the reasons for doing the geometry is this, this sort of pavilion would be the, um, the, uh, the central kind of event space uh, for the whole campus. You know, this is this part I showed earlier that's being expanded out here to the west. Um, that this piece will be, in a sense, multi-directional. Um, it was also a strong focus on, on the making of the roof, also working with Sobek again, um, how the roof could be a filter for light, um, but also as a kind of orientation place. Um, the campus is, is, is all sort of networked together through a series of uh, tunnels. Um, so the primary entrance to this thing uh, is at the tunnel level, which means that the, the main floor of the space, we could, we, we could sort of sink below um, ground level. Um, in going into the workshops, you know, we were these, you know, we'll be familiar to with, the, you know, these kind of um, branching structures again, or um, hierarchical systems like this, uh, cellular systems, uh, how that might interpret. Um, we began, uh, as we usually do, uh, making models, um, starting to anticipate materials that could, could activate these steel uh, wood structures. Um, at some point, there was a sketch where we took uh, a piece of honeycomb. Uh, aluminum, and, and we're thinking of that as at, at some point, even you know, which predates this project as a kind of structural diaphragm that could create some kind of space, some kind of a sectional space under it. At the same time, could be perforated and allow light through this 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 kind of chamber, you know, this this kind of structural depth. So, um, so, so 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 sometimes these again, this sort of comes out of that research area that you know resurfaces in terms of driving. Um, a project that all of a sudden is very, very specific. Um, after a couple of workshops um, with this idea of a hierarchy, uh, we started using a steel mainframe, and we went to steel because uh, we could create spaces that were, in a sense, almost column-free, and then to begin to infill those spaces what, with a wooden um, cellular webbing that could, could fill in that, and then we could take these into the, to, to the workshop and you know, shoot light through them, uh, very quickly start to understand uh, how these could work as, as a kind of, uh, again, as a kind of filter or a structural depth that could condition light in a certain way, either daylighting or artificial light through the structural depth of, of these pieces. Um, at the same time, we were doing a show at the Norsk Forum in, um, in Oslo with Alex de Rilke's piece here, The Naked House Project with, with Sadie Morgan. Um, Helen Hart, we're, we're working with the, the oil industry in Norway, and, and we, you know, we get a chance to, to sort of mock up our project at a scale of one to three. So there was, you know, and, you know, we're probably not the first ones to do this, but there was a lot of, you know, a lot of energy in terms of using the architectural exhibition as a kind of case study in terms of looking at how these things might perform spatially, how they might perform in terms of scale, uh, e even at a kind of reduced scale. Um, uh, like this. Some of the pieces started to go into a one-to-one -one scale, but, um, and, and also in connection with, you know, very, very different kinds of projects uh, with it. Um, at the same time, uh, we started working in a shop in the Black Forest, Holtzbaum Almond, uh, who's doing a project for us, doing a project for Shingura Ban, at the same time where uh, they started to m actual mock up the actual one-to-ones, and, you know, they had, you know, incredible software, hardware, where they could draw every single component, which, which really became, started to become really evident to us, this idea of mass customization, where uh, we simply couldn't have done this project 10 years ago. It would have been unaffordable. It would have been uh, too complex, too time-consuming, where these, um, and I guess what I think of as the kind of trickling down of these technologies to more everyday program types, you know, that aren't, you know, it's not a product of boutique somewhere. So, um, so that became quite, quite exciting how, um, we could we could access uh, this kind of technology uh, for a project, and the technology would actually make uh, uh, the project um, feasible. Um, and, and, and working with Werner, I think you know he wanted to cast like titanium spindles or for this. So I think that <laughs> you know there was also a process sort of dumbing down certain things just to make things simpler in terms of fastening and putting uh, certain projects uh, together. Um, the building as it's fairly close to how we're building right now, again, is at this kind of tunnel level. Uh, the roof is enclosing a, a kind of amphitheater uh, space below here. Um, 
so you have this hovering roof surface. You have a mezzanine level here that's above the kitchen stuff. And then, uh, then we try to come up with a very, very lacy light idea uh, for the facade, in a sense, not wanting any kind of enclosure underneath this thing. But um, again, you kind of see in the oblique view uh, the sort of plasticity or the three-dimensionality of this system as it's kind of curving and, and folding back uh, underneath it, um, you know, about six months ago. So the first move was this, this excavation of kind of hollowing out the ground to, to tunnel level and then placing this mezzanine, which can kind of fold up and down with these stair elements, which is slightly above uh, grade. Uh, this stuff, you know, this building, which I showed you earlier, will, you know, these can expand. These will go away um, at some point. And then uh, to create uh, a section where uh, this is at the Autobahn, these are the acoustical berms at the Autobahn, that, that that whole space just kind of slips through. Uh, and again, if you remember that first sketch, you get this pretty interesting compression where you have the roof either sort of you know, like hovering above your head at the mezzanine level or expanding uh, in this event space to a, to a double height uh, volume. But again, that the, the structural depth of the roof would, in a sense, be almost the same as, as some of the, the spaces that we were actually uh, defining. So that level of, of control became uh, an important move for us. So while we were, we were doing the wood stuff down in the Black Forest, these guys were trucking in steel, uh, local steel, which would have been prepared, you know, with these flanges. Uh, they could yank these things um, into the site, uh, start assembling them um, very quickly. So there's a certain aspect of, of, of prefabrication that's happening off-site, and then these things could come on site and be uh, assembled, you know, very, you know, very simply and very, very uh, quickly over some of these um, 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 spaces. And then in the yeah in the film, you can see how you know the, the guys from the wood shop would show up and then start in filling uh, this webbing, you know, very very quickly with with, with some. Um, scaffolding some uh, sort of uh, column pieces um, so you get a sense of, of, of the kind of making in terms of interfacing two uh, different materials the steel and the wood and how that how that happened uh, at the floor of the plans just quickly is again at tunnel level um, here uh, this is this main event space again this this tunnel system crisscrossing the campus uh, the kitchen stuff here the delivery stuff stuff over here and then you can see these kind of column clusters here, which go up to 20 meter spans, which was um, pretty sporty for us. And um, they were created as column clusters in order to stabilize the roof as a kind of shear wall uh, to keep it from tipping over uh, versus the mezzanine level here, which is again folds down these, these large uh, stairs here as a kind of um, open open space. There was a, a certain coating going on with the, the reflective ceiling planes with the cells. Some of the cells could be skylights, some of them could be uh, artificial lights, and um, some of them could be uh, acoustical panels. So they were kind of targeting, you know, based on some of the input we were getting back from the engineers, how uh, to best do that in, in the kind of making of this space uh, in uh, the sketch here. Again, the, the ground is, is up here. Um, so you kind of eliminate all the foreground stuff here. This is the old, you know, the stuff from the 80s back in here that to, to in a sense, uh, emphasize the idea of making an enclosure uh, for this uh, uh, building here. Uh, some early images of, of, of the, uh, the lattice uh, going in. Uh, this was last week where we covered the whole thing. Now we're going back in and starting to open up the skylights where you get these huge sort of blasts of, of light coming down through this thing and then a sense of the scale of these, these tapered uh, uh, T-sections for the facade, and then again these these column clusters here, which which stabilize uh, the whole uh, roof system, and then the main one of the main entrances here from from the tunnel system, in relationship to other pieces like these. These are precast concrete uh, pieces that that form uh, this sort of zigzag stair that that folds down from the mezzanine down uh, to the main level versus. Um, uh, these kinds of spaces again at the um, at the mezzanine level, where you have this very low space. Uh, at the same time, you're seeing some of the the, the the loading here to kind of pull this thing also back into form. Uh, these are temporary um, weights uh, put on the steel to kind of you know reef this thing uh, into into shape. And and again, it's the material is you know it's very sustainable. It's uh, um, a what we I guess in the states would call a glue lamb. Uh, wood that's um, you know about you know about that thick and then bolted together in a you know a very straightforward <laughs> way in a way. Uh, some of the details we've, we we went back to the honeycomb to make uh, light fixtures that fit up into these. These are artificial lights, 
and then and then there's areas like this where there's this kind of recovery. I think even even in this kind of technological landscape of Germany, there's you can still find hand craftsmen where we, we ask uh, and very economical. Uh, these are terracotta tiles uh, which are glazed with a kind of cobalt uh, blue glazing. We had two types: uh, convex and concave ones, um, which would be the cladding uh, for the base of the building. So. Um, these are industries like in places like the States, you know, disappeared, you know, 80 or 90 years ago. So, um, so it's, it, there's this kind of scouting around that you can still do that's quite, um, quite, quite interesting, I think, quite compelling. Um, <coughs> the last project uh, I wanted to show tonight was the, the, the Seoul project, which, which Brett knows well and wrote about. Um, and it was a very, <laughs> a completely different uh, approach than, than the other things we were working, not in terms of technology, but um, in, in, in context, if you think of that Dresden project where we're, you know, we're working in these incredibly saturated historical sites in Europe, um, all of a sudden we were working in a place called DMC next to the DMZ in Seoul, which was this kind of, you know, nowhere, you know, this kind of no man's land. Um, the city was developed to the south, uh, as far away as possible from the DMZ, so there's still a few sites left in the north that are still close to the airports. Um, that have been left open um, for development. Um, when we came to Seoul, you know, as, as, as you'll be familiar with these, uh, with many Asian cities, very uh, heterogeneous um, uh, condition co compared to what we are used to in, in, in Germany, to say the least. Um, we had inherited a kind of master plan over here next to the World Cup Stadium. Uh, these are kind of landfill parks over here, uh, the Han River uh, down here. Uh, you know, our first glance was at this kind of generic corporate uh, master plan and, you know, here's your site over here and it's adjacent to some kind of park over here. But it was very difficult to get a sense of, of where uh, one could even start as, as, as an architect, how one could operate uh, in such a place. Um, the sites were sort of staked out. Um, there was, um, you know, older residential areas on the other side of the river. Um, but there was no sense of even what the neighboring buildings um, would be. So, so one of the first things we looked at was, was uh, there was this recollection of, 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 of these kinds of buildings in the States in the 60s and 70s used near glass as a kind of device. There was this kind of desire for this perfect planar reflective surface that was, uh, even with the technology then, um, impossible. You know, there was always this level of just distortion. You know, there was, there, was, there was this kind of rhetoric going on about how these buildings were you know, friendly contextual buildings in relationship to Richardson's Trinity Church here. There was this kind of assimilation going on, this funny kind of discussion. But uh, so, so we kind of liked the idea, and we actually liked the idea of the facade being something, you know, really um, uh, distorted. And how we could, in a sense, rather than making a deficit, how could that be um, a virtue uh, in the project? So we started making our own, in a sense, you know, bad, you know, reflective curtain walls in the courtyard of our, our office space here and, and, and it would produce these quite amazing uh, kaleidoscopic fragmented um, effects. Uh, we wanted to, to control it more so we started producing these pattern studies that also understood the limitations on glass sizes, what was available um, and started to develop it you know in a way again from sort of the detail back uh, to the building. Uh, the zoning allowed us a building, you know, of this volume, this height, this width. Um, there was a move in terms of putting the core uh, off center in the probable lightless corner back over here. The whole thing stacked up over underground parking here. But to drape this, you know, in a sense, you know, very simple core and shell building with this, this, this lattice structure uh, of, of a facade. Um, Again, the siding of it, we, we, we knew there was a strong diagonal because there's going to be some kind of a park over here. So there was this indentation for the entrance that could work across there. Um, it was on the south side, so it kind of worked with uh, all that. Entrance with the parking garage here and then the core uh, off center here. So, I, I mean, <laughs> in terms of, you know, instant city, it was, it was just that. I mean, the whole master plan was being built sort of like from right to left, you know, you just, you know, somebody built one on this side, this side, this side, this side, this side. So, you know, we got <laughs> caught in between with, and, and the building, so, so we started seeing these buildings for the first time, which were these kind of, you know, not too bad, you know, kind of tasteful, you know, <laughs> modern buildings recurring to it, but, but already started to understand how our building could perform in terms of a kind of, 
you know, liminal surface that would mediate between what was going to be, you know, the very public exterior of the building and then the more or less private interior of office spaces here, showrooms um, down here. So, um, so, th so this was, you know, you know, again, in terms of trying to predict what was going to happen, it was, it was quite interesting uh, for us to see that. The plans, you know, uh, although they're core in, in shell, they, they still have 16 meter spans here. This is double height um, machine room. Uh, for exhibitions here, uh, a lobby here, core here. Uh, in this section, uh, you know, you have this, again, the facade sort of wiggling up within a very shallow depth, only 20, 25 uh, centimeters up through that. Higher sections here uh, for showrooms and then more compact sectional, uh, clear heights uh, above. And then, you know, this kind of underground, you know, and very, you know, valuable uh, parking underneath this. Um, and going back to the analog models, again, in order for us to even uh, begin to understand how, um, how these, these frames might, you know, in terms of geometry, start to work together, we had to build our own frames to start to study that, uh, you know, thinking and working back to how the, the, the construction section would work. Um, we started working after our, our, our Swiss facade company abandoned us. Um, we started, the, the Korean guy said, we'll do it, you know, we'll, we'll build this facade for you. And uh, he said, well, you know, and the guys from our ops were there and like, like, do you ever see a facade like this in downtown Manhattan? Well, <laughs> you better <laughs> get these guys up to speed. And so, so Allotech, the, the Korean firm, bought German CNC cutting machines and started teaching themselves how to cut these profiles. So what they would do is buy kind of off-the-shelf aluminum profile like this with a lot of sort of depth to it, um, which would allow sort of infinite amount of cuts through the, to the shaping. So there's this kind of off the shelf approach to the project and then again through the CNC kind of could allow again which is a, a sort of a standard office building um, to to create a very very unconventional uh, facade and in a sense uh, for the first time um, another component that they sort of were these these joints which allow the frames to be stiff and allow uh, in a way these control the geometry and allow this thing to be within a kind of you know three or four millimeter uh, tolerance um, these are the frames being uh, built in the in the workshop in um, in Seoul. Um, this is Jerry coming over for ARPS from uh, from Hong Kong. So he would do workshops uh, with these guys, and uh, so in a way, it was this um, it was it was kind of this perfect um, joining of, of, of people with expertise with people with who were simply willing to do something like this, even though it was completely out of the, the bounds of, of, of their experience. Uh, this is a corner piece, which is a you know, highly complex piece that they were able to control in the shop and then uh, with these glazing uh, conditions. One of the conditions from the client uh, was a Singapore-based developer was that they would have to uh, do one of these mock-ups. This is without the mirrored glass and then, you know, blast this thing, you know, with <laughs> hurricane strength, you know, water and, and uh, uh, wind to see if it worked and it worked. So then we got the green light and then we could go into production. The glass came from uh, Viacom from um, Minnesota, and then the frames were built there. They would assemble them and stage them, and then put them up on the building. So, and you get a sense of the scale of some of the larger pieces, which you know are, are um, enormous. And uh, they would they'd fit these things in. Uh, the facades uh, from the interior are uh, transparent, mirrored glass, and uh, a so-called shadow box here. Some of the more complex geometries due to condensation. Um, Got it's almost like a kind of X-ray film type uh, thing, but what it did is produce this kind of uh, again a kind of lattice panorama wrapper from the interior for these again kind of loft-like office spaces. Uh, this is you know the the, the, the whole skin uh, here. Uh, we continued the skin up over the core to produce uh, roof gardens, which you know they use. You can it's like you know <laughs> Smoker Deluxe. Uh, <laughs> It's a pretty good place. Um, it, we, we, there was a certain economics of it, like we knew there was a building going in here, so we made this facade uh, simpler, so the, the three-dimensional thing, in a sense, emerges out uh, of that surface as it wraps the corner, so there was certain tactical um, uh, decisions like that. This is the, the, the core at the corner, which is clad in a, a zinc, black zinc uh, shingle, which was another sort of, you know, nice, discovery uh, there that we could find things like that as well as you know incredible tile uh, work but uh, at the same time there was also again the the, the transformation of the facade uh, became a, a strong issue where 
uh, we knew that on a 24-hour cycle you could go from transparent to opaque uh, to, to reflective. Um, so this, this was also the kind of discovery of, of the actual experience of this thing was quite, uh, quite, uh, quite interesting as it, as it changed through either you know, daylighting, weather, traffic, um, you know, people moving by, cars moving by, as well as sort of um, this kind of animation of the, of the facade. Uh, by uh, traffic, uh, you know, people moving by. So this, this <laughs> the window cleaners are lunatics. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, these guys are total lunatics. Uh, um, yeah, they should be climbing Everest. Um, and and th there was all this kind of razzmatazz. Unlike American, you know, corporate office blocks, there's housing here. There's this whole street scene that's sort of like instantaneous here. So it's not like this dead zone at night. There's this kind of, again, instant city in the sense of, of, of every aspect of, of, of the kind of animation of what's happening there. Um, the facade opens up, it, it, there's the windows open. In this case, these are these kinds of barn doors for bringing uh, machines in for, for, for showroom display. Um, again, you know, another sort of engineering feat, um, the entrance here, this kind of indentation, uh, where there was an idea of a, a kind of play with the surface depth where it could be produce a lot of effect, I think, in a very shallow amount of space or through punching that at a much, much deeper uh, interview in terms of marking uh, the entrance uh, in relationship to the stair here, which became also a kind of special uh, component. Uh, we engineered the stair with uh, Mike Schleich uh, out of Stuttgart with the idea of making a stair like a, a marionette. The entire stair is floating on these like quarter-inch uh, steel cables, so the whole thing is just sort of kind of bouncing off, off, off the ceiling. So, um, I don't know, a lot of it's like, like, I guess like seeing what you can get away with probably. Um, there was, you know, the lobby, there was a, a wood surface that kind of, the lobby changed scale and then created walls also in the lobbies here. And a lot of the spaces kind of echoed some of the earlier work we did, which are simply, you know, very simple and straightforward uh, industrial uh, spaces such as this, this large uh, showroom at, at the, uh, at the uh, at, at the ground level, um, this is a typical office space here with a, with a facade. Again, you kind of see the structural depth of it um, and how how it works with uh, the trans translucencies. Uh, um, and and again, that that idea of the facade is something that uh, transforms. Um, I think this is my last slide. I, the only thing I wanted to say about this is, I think if 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 imitation is the the most sincerest form of flattery then Korea has to be the most flattering place I've ever been in my life. This was a, a boutique in downtown uh, Seoul that was within five months, they had perfectly ripped <laughs> off <laughs> our facade and, and, and got a much more shishi sort of program client. <laughs> so um, it, it, it's astonishing and we, we didn't know whether to be uh, flattered or uh, outraged, but uh, uh, I think uh, it must be the nature of research that uh <laughs> Everybody uh, can have a, a shot at it. Um, that's 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 the end of the, the presentation. Um, it's great to be back, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation. <laughs> hmm? Huh? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I'll start. I think I, I uh, thank you very much for the lecture. It's, it's uh, an amazing body of work. I'll, let me, I'll open it up for questions here in just a minute. Let me offer a first one for Frank to, uh, to warm, warm up a bit after the, after the talk. Um, and I do want to, you threw out transparent concrete early on. And I, I, I'm hoping you all have had a chance to experiment with it um, since making that first model a few years ago. Seeing the work together, I think one of the interesting features of, th of the evolution of the machines and then your experiments within it is a movement, and, and it's interesting especially in Germany to see this, a sort of shift from concrete architectures, yeah. a, a certain kind of modernism that really was something you would associate with, with concrete slabs, heavy space, to towards experiments with a range of well, in fact, a, a broad palette of other materials, more and more with you guys. I mean, sure. not just the aluminum and glass of the cladding system here, um, or the steel work of the roof, but also the, the recent, uh, the stuff you guys had in Norway at the exhibit with wood, sure. kind of laminated wood. 
Anything going on with concrete in the office these days? Um, I think, um, oh, sorry, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think, I think with uh, Schleich, there's a couple of projects that we've been trying to pull off with uh, a self-insulating concrete, and then there's also the, what you're probably familiar with is the translucent uh, concrete. So I think we're, we're trying to, it's expensive. It's not, it hasn't, it hasn't trickled down yet, and we haven't been able to, to access it yet, but it's, it's in the cards. I think, and, and a lot of, the, I mean like the concrete, is it concrete or wood or steel? Again, it's, it's uh, again, I guess there's a, this sort of casual approach again. It seems like wherever we go, there are, despite globalization, um, the c conditions or opportunities are quite different in different places. So, you know, if we're doing something in the States, it'll probably be steel. And, and the concrete work early on had to do with southern Germany and places like Switzerland where they still do that and they can do it. And 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 other um, building cultures, we wouldn't we wouldn't try to do that. So I think there is this one issue is sort of exploiting what you find on the ground and, and using that uh, to the best uh, you can, and 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 finding out and finding out is usually you know through engineers or local or somebody probably can do that. So I think I think there is a kind of we find ourselves sort of um, you know wiggling around, and it's not you know okay we're going to do this kind of uh, technology here, and it, it just simply doesn't work. So um, again, the, this, the, the thing with the cutting of the facade of Korea was uh, kind of lucky in a way, you know, but we were able to make that work, but there would be no, absolutely no, I mean, it would be way too risky. If we, I think if we would have tried to do something in concrete or something, it would have been um, beyond, beyond the realm. But I think through engineers like Schleich who are introducing these things, and it's Again, it's a kind of trickling down, it feels like. These things become available and you try to access them, but um, they're too difficult or too complex. But it's just, it's, it feels like a matter of time, yeah. you know, like the formwork. So we can kind of prepare these things at a kind of, in a sense, utopian sense. Um, but I don't think they're that far away. You know, I, th I think that project that we sort of, um, through Consett, I think, is probably something we would get at, you know, I think within the next five or six years, you know, so we go from something that's completely, uh, so and, and, and again, I think that's what I mean by the kind of trickling down of that. In, in seeing that project for the first time, I remember it, you know, it's, it's hard not to put it in the legacy of glass surfaces that you even kind of showed it and introduced it in here, but there is an interesting prehistory of thick surface buildings like Nervi or, or uh, Late Breuer, the kind of pa also tiled, yeah. panelized, thick and in fact often shaped out of precast panels yeah. that might be yeah. a kind of source to work with that's outside of just the glass legacy which right. would be interesting. Well there's this right? building here, I mean the, the, yeah, yeah. the center point. Which yeah, the whole brutalist, you know, yeah, which, Colonel which, which Seifert's. has that kind of plastic huh. gap, um, but it's reversed. There, there the glass, I was just looking at it yesterday, the glass edges are very conventional, they're very, they're orthogonal, they're very yeah. simple, yeah. Um, and, it, and it's this sort of structural frame that is, is where all the kind of dynamic and the movement is, so um, whereas here it's, 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 it's that, you know, three centimeter skin that, that, that's yeah. doing all the motion. And, and in the case, the structure is quite neutral somewhere behind. Uh, another iteration of this could be that the structure is, you know, part of that system and oh. it's also yeah. uh, moving, which could be more, in certain ways, maybe uh, more, more, more consistent. But I think the Breuer was about that, that nervy, that, that, that structural frame somehow. And this somehow is about the actual skin now doing that. Um, before it would have been difficult. And just a last question before I pass it to the audience. But the when you were teaching here and with your students and the way the work was presented and discussed, often there was a there was a bit of research also going into seriality and repetition itself as structural operations, as design operations. And I know you're a fan of the you know as I am of a certain legacy in New York out of late '60s and '70s, Lewitt. And Smithson and others yeah, who yeah. who developed tiling operations, yeah, yeah. you know, as a form of their own practice, which clearly, clearly I, I has been informing this for many years. I'm just wondering your latest comments on all of that. Is it a world that's now? I mean, I mean is all the energy and focus lying in in the technology and tools? Is there any anything that's trying to look back now? At what that offers beyond just the obvious technologies, yeah. scripting operations, right. which many people today are talking about, but aren't embedding in any kind of a cultural practice or, or right. legacy at all right. that I know you're right. fully fully aware of yeah. and, and kind of understand. The minimalist, it's, I don't. It's funny because it's interesting with, with missing some of these guys, Sarah and artists like Chris Chris Burton had, had uh, Judd, you know, had had formulated actually very clear 
critiques about architects and architecture and, and how it was practiced and, and the production of it. So I think it was almost, I think, the impact of those criticisms of how one might relate to site or how uh, one might, you know, Judd says, you know, architects, you know, wouldn't know what space was, you know, if he ran into it, you know. So there w it was more about a criticism aimed at the production of architecture than, um, for me at least, rather than the actual formal or geometrical um, strategies uh, that, that, that were employed. But I, th I think Smithson or, or even Matt Clark uh, had very clear uh, uh, positions toward, toward architecture. And I think there, there's certain formal aspects of projects like Smithson's mirrored displacements or again, how that, that, that behaves or I in a kind of natural environment that were um, super compelling, you know, uh, to us as a, as a kind of device that could produce a certain effect. So I think there's a kind of awareness of that in, again, a very unpredictable uh, uh, and transforming uh, context. So I think those, those kind of glitch projects, you know, that are both assimilating and camouflaging themselves into a, a condition like that are quite, quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, the mere displacements project. Questions from the audience?